Rob, I organize IDEA the IPO. We've been doing events in Silicon Valley for many, many years. We have a busy calendar of events. I want to highlight a few events that are coming up. This Thursday at Wilmer Hale in Palo Alto, that's uh, January 30th, Events <coughs> Capital Panel, Hottest Trends for 2020. Uh, later on in February, in collaboration with Startup Grind, we are promoting Startup Grind Global Conference 2020. It's their 10 year anniversary, and our members get 15% off. So check out the details for those events and all of our events on our website, ideatipo.com. We launched officially on February 1st, 2010. At that time, we had no members and no events on our calendar. At this stage, we have over 70,000 members among all our meetup groups in the Bay Area. We've organized, promoted, and produced over 2,150 events. We're the most active, most prolific startup event organization in Silicon Valley, bar none. Thank you. Uh, so actually, since February 1st, 2020, is a few days from today, we are actually celebrating our 10th anniversary all this week. So there's going to be a celebration today, tomorrow, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So all the events on the calendar will have a form of a celebration. We have two events that are not on the calendar. They're private events, but uh, if you talk to me, you'll get an invitation, hopefully. Uh, our mission is to promote entrepreneurship, support entrepreneurs, build community, and provide value in the Silicon Valley startup ecosystem. To that end, we provide content that's practical, actionable, and relevant, stuff you can actually use to succeed as entrepreneurs. And we believe in building community because Silicon Valley attracts people from all over the world who come here to do great things. Who here is not originally from Silicon Valley or the greater San Francisco Bay Area? Who here was born and raised in Silicon Valley or the greater San Francisco Bay Area? <laughs> Two natives. All right, let's hear it for the natives. So in addition to our content-oriented events throughout the week, we also have some fun social events on Friday nights. And the next one happens to be this Friday, January 31st, at the Hyatt Regency in Santa Clara. And it's hosted by Colby LaCour and Joe Ashwood. So let's hear for Colby and Joe. So that's a free TGIF mixer at the Hyatt Regency Santa Clara. It's a free event. You're all invited. With regard to value, it is important that we provide value at each and every one of our events. So we make sure that our events are affordable because we know many entrepreneurs are struggling financially. If you cannot afford the cover charge for whatever reason, come talk to me and we can work something out. And at each and every one of our events, we make sure that we provide a delicious buffet meal. Uh, is this a delicious buffet meal? Yes. Well, I want to thank Royce Law Firm for sponsoring that delicious buffet meal. So let's hear it for Royce Law Firm. Uh, Royce Law Firm is also sponsoring the cake, and we have some haagen Doss ice cream. So stick around. That's all going to happen at 8.30 p.m. at the end of the formal program. So uh, thank, thanks for stepping up, Roy Soffer. Most importantly, though, at each and every one of our events, we want to make sure that we provide value for your time, which is your most valuable resource. I always have to ask, is anyone here getting any younger besides our speaker? So when you invest your valuable time to come to our events, we want to make sure that you maximize your ROI. We have many, many partners that help us do what we do. Law firms, venture capital firms, angel investor groups, incubators, accelerators, co-working spaces, colleges, universities, lots of players in the Silicon Valley startup ecosystem. Tonight, we're grateful to TechCode for hosting us at this beautiful venue. Is this a beautiful venue? So let's hear it for TechCode. So if you want to find out what happens at TechCode, come talk to me. I can connect you with Sean Flynn, who's uh, the general manager here. Uh, there's a lot of great stuff going on here. We have other partners here tonight. I would like to also have them uh, be acknowledged and have them come up and say a few words. So let's hear it for Pramal and City National Bank. Applause. Hello, everybody. I'm from uh, City National Bank right here in Palo Alto. Sunnyvale up here, but we do a lot of events at Palo Alto, so it's closer to my branch. Um, 
just here if you have any questions about deposits, lending, or anything, let me come and see me. Um, the rates are pretty low right now, so if you have any questions on commercial or residential, just come and see me. Thank you. Uh, let's hear it for Anita and Happiness Doctors. Applause. I'm Anita, the founder and chief strategist at Happiness Factor. At Happiness Factor, we create happy mindsets, and we do that without using drugs, alcohol, or marijuana. We strive to be the global leader in everything emotional wellness and happiness, and make it so easily available that you can have your happiness at your fingertips. If you want to know more about it, come find me later. And I'm also looking for a game developer and some people who are willing to help me beta test my new product. Thank you so much. Uh, and I would just like to reiterate that at our events, there is no drugs or alcohol or marijuana. We do have chocolate mousse cake and ice cream. And I think that's, accept that's acceptable. Just to check. So here's the schedule for the rest of the evening. Our featured speaker will present. He's got an awesome slide deck. Audience members, hold your questions until 8 p.m. At that point, we'll open up to audience questions. If you want a copy of the slides, you can email Roger directly. We'll take questions from 8 to 8.30 p.m. Roger will take as many questions as possible. He likes to emphasize he's not giving out legal advice. Uh, he's giving out information, but he's not charging. So we'll take advantage of that opportunity. So without further ado, I want to introduce our featured speaker tonight. He is one of the top corporate startup attorneys in Silicon Valley. He's the founder of Royce Law Firm. And frankly, he is an iconic figure in Silicon Valley. He's everywhere. He's at meetups, conferences, charity events, at the Rosewood. He's everywhere. And he's passionate, passionate about helping entrepreneurs succeed. So let's give it up for Roger Royce. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm Roger, the founder of the Royce Law Firm. We're about 30 lawyers based in Menlo Park, with offices and a few other places. Um, we're a full service law firm, but mostly what we do, almost all of what we do is technology startups. And um, I've been in the Valley for a long time and I work with companies. How many entrepreneurs here, by the way? Okay, any investors here? All right, oh, there he is, I found him. Um, <laughs> So we work almost exclusively with tech startups. I've been doing it for a long time, and uh, over the years, certainly have gotten to understand what it takes to get a, get a company to venture financing. And I gather you're here because you want to find out what you're going to have to do for your company. And that's sort of a mixed legal and business um, issue. Um, and because I'm a lawyer, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, a lot about the, the legal side of this, but also some of the business issues and some of just the startup stuff that you're not going to find written down any place. Um, let's get this out of the way. Uh, <clears throat> not legal advice, um, but um, just good information, as Rob says. So question number one, um, I want to pause on this for a minute. This is usually a pretty easy answer, but still a little more thought how to go into this. So now you've got an idea. Maybe you've got a couple co-founders. Um, and uh, you think you might have somebody, uh, a rich uncle, who might put a little money behind it, and you've got some IP and you're ready to launch this thing, the very first question you're going to have to ask is, what kind of company should I be? Uh, or should I even be a company at all? Almost all of the startups in this valley you know, are, are, are what we call Delaware C corporations. Delaware is the, is the state where it's organized. A C designation means that is a tax thing. It means that it's a separate tax-paying entity, almost always. The reason why uh, is because that's all that the venture capitalists will invest in. And even though you're not ready for venture capital today, you're hoping that you're going to get some down the road at some point. So it's usually a little easier just to start out as a C corporation if that's the way you're going. Now, I just want to pause on this for a minute and, and tell you that usually there's a little more of a discussion around this. And you sh everyone should take a step back. Um, I, this, in 2019, I did, I think, the sixth or seventh deal exit for one of my serial entrepreneur found, um, um, founders. Uh, um, he's done several companies like this, and 
Now he's done, now he's retired, now he's gonna go be an investor. And I did the first deal with him, I think 25 years ago. And um, he, he created a company, he built it, and he sold it. Every single one of them was an S corporation. He did it right here in Silicon Valley. He built it, and he took money. You know, it was a little tricky, but we were able to take money um, from investors. But he did that over and over again as an S corp, not as a C corp. And it got me thinking, you know, gee, I wonder what would have happened. What would the difference be if he had been a C corp? And the difference in tax savings was millions and millions of dollars over his lifetime, over that 25 years of building and selling it. So it's not an automatic, you know, you know, it's your default, but you ought to think about it. For him, he wasn't going to issue preferred stock to venture capitalists. He was going to build it till it hit somewhere between 30 and 100 million dollars, and he was going to sell it. Um, so he didn't need venture capital money. So it made a lot more tax sense to make the S election. It's the kind of a calculus you ought to go through when you form your company. Now, his is the kind of company that he could build it up, it became profitable, and it was saleable even without venture money. So that's not most of my clients in Silicon Valley, but that's some of them. And you ought to think about choice of entity. Now, on the other hand, here's how I look at it. If you're the kind of company that's going to be profitable, if you're a lifestyle business, and you're going to be able to basically generate enough income to, to pay the owners, that maybe you want to do something very tax efficient, like a limited liability company or an S corporation. They're tax efficient, they're called pass-throughs, because there's one level of tax under income. And it's had a very low rate these days, since 2017. If, on the other hand, you're the kind of company that is either going to raise a lot of money um, and become a very big company, or you're going to be nothing at all, then you're a candidate, then you're a C corporation. That's a classic venture capital type play. So that's kind of how I usually think about it. Uh, the reason I'm talking more about it right now than usual is because the, the scales have tipped way in favor of C corps. And there's this thing you need to know about um, early on. So don't mess this up. It's called qualified small business stock. And since 2010 now, investors in qualified small business stock can exclude all of the gain. They don't pay tax on any of their gain from the sale of their stock, no federal tax, up to $10 million or 10 times their cost. It's a huge benefit. Everybody knows about it. Every investor thinks about it. They're going to want you to tell them they're getting qualified small business stock. And the first thing that your company has to be in order to offer that is it has to be a C corporation. All right? And it's not just your investors. It's you, too. You, the founders. You know, the stock that you get in your company qualifies for this benefit as well. So there's really good reasons for being a C corporation for the typical startup. So I just want to pause on that because you're going to, because I still see a lot of companies formed as something else. And there may be good reasons for doing it. But probably not if you're going to be the kind of company that's going to be a venture capital play. Choice of jurisdiction. Um, what do you think the number one state is for incorporation? Delaware. Yeah, clearly. I mean, I'm a California. In fact, I'm licensed in six states. None of them are Delaware, but 99% of the companies I form are under Delaware law. Um, it is just the standard, right? Everybody, it is internationally recognized. Um, and, and again, because of where we are, why is that? The venture capital industry drives that. VCs want to invest in Delaware corporations. I can give you all the technical reasons why if you want to know, but suffice it to say that that's what you're going to have to be to get venture capital funding. So again, it's a lot easier to just start out as a Delaware corporation than to be a California corp and then try to change later. Or worse, be an LLC and try to change later. You can do that, but it's a lot easier to start out your life as a Delaware C, corp Delaware C corporation. Um, other states. I'm hearing Wyoming pop up a lot lately. And you all know why. Have you heard about Wyoming? Anybody here in the crypto business? Blockchain in the back? Okay. Um, so Wyoming has, has a bunch of laws, state laws that are very crypto friendly, right? They're, you know, they, they, there's a regulatory sandbox for crypto businesses. You know what I mean by crypto, cryptocurrencies. Uh, and, and tokens, digital assets. Uh, and there's like one lawyer uh, in Wyoming um, who you know, went off and got a degree from Harvard and came back to her state and has just been on a, a rampage to turn Wyoming into the model you know, for a crypto-friendly jurisdiction. And a lot of companies are locating there just to do crypto, to do mining, you know, to do development, to do sort of crypto businesses. 
with that one exception, you know, you still ought to be in Delaware as a general rule. But you'll see Wyoming pop up. Nevada, we used to see Nevada a lot. Not so much anymore since they changed their laws a few years ago to make every company there have a business license. So you want to be in Delaware. Enough said. Let's talk about your team. And um, so um, almost everybody in the room is a startup entrepreneur. Is, is, does everybody have a co-founder? How many, let me put it this way. How many of you do not have co-founders? Oh, okay, so that's four of you. Um, four out of this crowd. So typically, um, typically it takes a village. Typically, most companies I see, they have a technical person and a business person. And the investors that I talk to, they all seem to agree that they really, really, really want to see a technical co-founder. Are you technical, Anita? Okay. Well, you got to have somebody who's got a lot of skin in the game, you know, who's going to you know, put the effort in that it takes on the technical side, if you're a tech company, obviously, uh, who, who's, you know, and that's somebody who does more than just work for a salary or a wage or even an hourly. So most investors, you know, they're going to say, I want to see a technical co-founder. Not always, you know, maybe you find a workaround, maybe you're such an awesome business person that you can contract that out, maybe you've got enough personal money you can hire that. As a general rule, we want to, it usually takes more than one person. So that's where things get complicated. If there's just one founder in the company, all of this stuff gets way easier, right? Because you don't need vesting, you don't need um, employment agreements. One founder controls everything. Now you've got co-founders. So now we have to put in place all the mechanisms that it takes to um, make sure that the people are going to work together towards the right goal. Now, um, two things on, on founders, and I get this question all the time. It's how much equity should the founders have? How do we divide the equity? There's three of us. How, do, how should we split it up? The most common way is probably the worst way is just equally. Three of us will split it three ways. I see that more, more often than not. Another way people do it is they do some sort of formula, sort of. I'm full time, you're part time, so I get two thirds, you get one third. That's a little better. Um, although it sort of rewards the person that can negotiate the hardest. Um, there's another method called dynamic split. It's basically a formula that changes daily depending on how much effort each of the parties puts into the venture. If you're interested in learning about dynamic split, you can go to the website www.slicingpie.com and download some of their tools. And there are others, but that's one of them uh, that I've seen a lot. And it'll give you an example of some formula that you can put in. So at any given day, every day people come in and they enter their time, their, the money they put in, the supplies they provide it, the IP they contribute it. They weight it, they value it, and we just add up the value of their inputs. And their relative value is their relative percentages. It's pretty simple that way. Um, so why am I talking so much about this? There's a study from um, Harvard Business School from a few years ago that showed that companies that used a formula or a dynamic split or something like that uh, tended to be valued at least 20% higher than companies that just did the split equally. Okay, This is Harvard, so I believe them. Statistically, they've shown that you actually get a better valuation if you use a little more sophisticated way of valuing the company. So keep that in mind. You know, Most companies don't think about that as much as they should. But just keep that in mind that you might want to think about something other than just equal split. Why do you suppose that is, by the way? Why would they get a higher valuation? I think it's, I, I, we don't know, but intuitively it seems that I think, first of all, the investors are not going to price the company as high if they think the wrong team's in place or if the incentives are all wrong, right? Secondly, people might not work as hard if they think they're supporting a slacker, <laughs> someone who's got more stock than they should have. You know, and thirdly, the person who doesn't have as much stock as they should might not work as hard either. Secondly, advisors. Um, most companies have advisors now. Now, by advisors, that's different than a founder, it's different than a consultant, it's different than a director. An advisor is that person that you need for that one particular area of expertise, right? You're um, getting into a new vertical, and um, you need somebody who has a big Rolodex and can introduce you to all the right people. Um, or you need someone that can close some big contracts starting out. Or you need someone that can help you meet the investors and find money. I'm an advisor to several companies for stuff like that, um, or I used to be. Um, 
The thing about advisors is they're not, they're not fiduciaries, they're not directors, they're not officers. You know, they're basically engaged for that one little specific thing. Maybe it's technical, technical advisors. So the question comes up, well how, well, how do we attract and retain and reward advisors? So you're a startup, you got a lot of equity, you don't have a lot of cash, so you're going to give them equity, right? How much equity should you give an advisor? First of all, we all know what an advisor is, right? You're going to hire that technical superstar to help you get your product to, um, you know, to your beta or to, uh, you know, a minimum viable product. Um, how much equity do we give them? Generally, an advisor is about a quarter percent equity in options. That's generally true. Now, um, there's a, uh, an agreement I like to use. It's called the FAST agreement. It's developed by Founders Institute just right down the street in Palo Alto here. And it has a little grid attached to it where you can determine how much to give an advisor. Um, and um, it's basically how early is the stage of your company and how involved is the advisor. And you find their position on a grid. And it'll be somewhere between 1 8th and 1% usually. Percent of the uh, fully diluted capitalization of the company. So all the stock of the company. Typ typical advisory board member, you know, they s we start at a quarter of 1%. You know, Rob likes me to take questions at the end here. So just, you, if you hold your questions, I promise I'll get to them. All right, sorry. Um, okay, that's founders and that's advisors. Um, the thing about advisors to keep in mind before you start running out and signing these people up, uh, and the same thing with founders, you know, once we figured out how much stock we should give to them, how do we keep them involved and engaged in the company? And that's where we want to put in place vesting restrictions. It's just so important. You know, there's nothing that will kill a company faster than not having vesting. So, um, found, and do, does everyone know what I mean by vesting? So that's the concept that the stockholder earns into their shares through continued service. Typically, a founder will have three or four years of vesting. In other words, you have to stay with the company that long in order to fully vest in your shares. And that means when you leave, you keep your vested shares, but the company can buy back your unvested shares. So a typical three-year vesting schedule with a one-year cliff means that if you stay for a year, right, and then you leave, you keep a third of your shares, but the other two-thirds, it's sold back to the company at cost, which is pretty close to zero. They're forfeited, in effect. That's vesting. Founders and... Um, Founders, typically three or four years. Rank and file people, typically four to five years. Uh, that's consultants and employees. Advisors, typically two years, okay? Because the advisor's there for a very specific purpose. It's usually a shorter vesting period. And the advisor's vesting will typically accelerate, meaning all the shares will vest when you sell the company. You'll see that more often in an advisory agreement. So don't freak out about that. Now, here we go. So acceleration, just so you know, um, the idea behind acceleration is that, um, well, let's say I'm a founder and there's three of us and I'm subject to vesting. I might be thinking, well, gee, I've got three years of vesting. What if we sell this company within a year? Um, I don't know. I think I should vest in all my shares. So in other words, if Microsoft comes along and we do a stock for stock deal, so I get stock in acquiring company in exchange for my stock in selling company, that stock and acquiring company will have that same vesting schedule, so I got to stick around after the deal. I might say I should be able to exit at that point. I should be able to be fully vested in all that stock so I can leave and sell it. You generally never get that, okay? Uh, that's one type of single trigger. It's a single trigger because it triggers full acceleration. Another type people used to talk about is, well, what if I get terminated without cause? There's three of us, two of them, they can gang up on me, they can fire me, and you know, vesting, if you're not working for the company, you got to give back your unvested shares. So how about uh, we put in a single trigger that says if I get terminated without cause, so it's not my fault, I'm not coming to work drunk or anything, um, then uh, I should get full vesting. That's another single trigger. You never get that. Sometimes people ask for it, you know, it's never awarded. Uh, what you do get sometimes is double trigger vesting, which means that if both of those things happen within a short period of time, then you get accelerated or full or partial acceleration of vesting. I mean, you get extra shares vested. In other words, if the company gets acquired and it turns out I'm redundant because, I don't know, I'm the CFO and I already have a CFO, and because of that they terminate me, well, okay, that's remote enough. We'll let you vest in your shares. So here's kind of the interesting thing about that. I did a talk yesterday 
on M&A exits. And in my research for that, because believe it or not, I do research these things, I found out that very few deals these days are stock for stock deals. It's very few are fully stock for stock, two to 4%. Is, is it ever gonna be that you're gonna sell your company solely in exchange for stock of another company? So it's pretty rare that you're gonna take the vesting that you have on your shares and apply it to the shares you're getting. Um, a much higher percent is stock and cash, I'll admit. But by far, more, like 80% of deals are for cash, right? And it's cash. Now the vesting can still matter because you might have, because the cash might be deferred. It might be over a period of three years. In fact, usually it is. And your vesting might mean that you have to be employed by the company, the acquiring company, in order to get your cash. So it still matters, but probably not as much as you might think. Um, so not an issue I'd probably fall on my sword over. Um, I'll talk about management and control of the company a little bit. So corporations are, are managed by a board of directors. Directors select officers. Officers sign contracts. Um, first, your first board of directors should be no more than three. Okay, Don't make the mistake of getting too big a board. And make sure people know that they're going to have to come off of that board when you get an institutional investor or venture capitalist. So no more than three, maybe even just one. That's you know, very common. Now when your investors come on, your first round, your first equity round, your first priced round, they're going to want a board seat. Um, you will not give up control of your company. You should not give up control of your company uh, when you do your first equity round, meaning you're not going to sell more than half the stock. It'll typically be 20 to 30 percent. You'll have another tranche reserved for option plans. Um, and you shouldn't give up control of your board. You'll give up one board seat. Uh, at worst, investor will have a board seat. This is the venture capitalist in your A round. Investor will have a board seat. You, the founder, will have a board seat. And the third one would be somebody that you agree on, or it'll be somebody selected by the rest of the common stock. So, so you, the founder, you don't have complete reign over the company anymore after you take outside money. But on the other hand, you haven't turned your company over to the investors yet. That'll change in Series B. But Series A, just plan for giving up 20%, 30%, maybe 40 having a reserve for an option pool, but you stay at above 50% stock and one or two of three members of the board. Now, um, so where this becomes a problem is a lot of people want to be in that boardroom. Want to people, a lot of people want to be in there making decisions, but you don't want a big board. It's just too hard to get people together. You know, you have to gather them together. They have to vote on stuff. You know, they're traveling around the world. If it gets to be a big board, it's hard to get quorum. So how do we accommodate this fact that we want a nice, small, odd number board, by the way, so we can take action. We want a nice, small board, but we want a lot of people to have a, have a say in this. And that's where we get this concept of observers. And those are people who can sit in the boardroom, they can participate in the discussions, but they just can't vote. So when it comes time to vote, you know, they can't say anything. But they can certainly weigh in. We do that almost always uh, w once you get into the later rounds because there are so many stakeholders. You put together an equity round and you've got a lead investor and a bunch of participants behind them. You know, you want to have observers so they can have a say in what they're doing. All right, super voting stock. You've all heard the story of Zuckerberg and Facebook. This question comes up enough where I want to mention it. Um, so the idea is that you get a founder that says, in fact, I, I hear this a lot. You know, and uh, most of the time I talk people out of doing this, but sometimes I don't. It's class F stock. And it's the idea that there's a class of common stock that the founder owns and has super voting rights. Because the founder is looking at the cap table and saying, okay, um, I'm, I've got more, I've got a majority of the shares today. Once I get an investor, that's going to dilute all of us. And us common stockholders as a whole are going to have a majority, but I'm going to have less than 50% once we take in outside money. So I'm not going to be able to control the company unless I have a bigger vote. So that's the idea of Class F stock. It's founder stock that has this um, super voting component to it. So the founder can maintain control of the company uh, throughout past Series A and can maintain control and vote on behalf of all of the common stock for a long time, way into, in, way, you know, theoretically, you know, throughout the company's life. So that's the idea. That's a founder who really needs to maintain control. He sold a lot of common stock to option E, service providers, advisors, what have you, but he doesn't want them running his company or, or being able to block his decisions. 
Now, I just said I talk people out of that a lot. The reason I do that is because I don't see investors let you get away with it, right? You know, maybe in your A round, but eventually the investors typically will negotiate that away. They don't want any one person having that much power in a company. They don't want any one person being able to block anything. Um, so not always, but you know, unless you're a real superstar, you know, you're probably not going to get those rights. So I tend not to bother with it. Well, I'll talk a little bit about, so this is how to get your company ready for venture financing, right? Those are just some things that you probably ought to know about. Um, I want to talk about some of the diligence issues that are going to come up. So this is California. It's 2020. Uh, as of January 1, we had a whole bunch of new laws come into effect. Um, I, I will tell you that many of them are unique in this country and will surprise people from outside the state when they come in to do acquisitions or investment. And uh, they're no more uh, prominent than in the area of employment law. Um, does everybody know about AB5? You've heard about AB5, yeah, the anti-gig economy bill. Um, so AB5 is the law that has just now become effective. Um, it's already been struck down by a court as it applies to long-haul truckers, interstate truckers. Um, so AB5 is the bill that um, basically treats Uber drivers as employees. Let me put it that way. So if uh, the test now for whether someone's an independent contractor or an employee, the test now under this statute is, is it's a bunch of things, but the important factor is that if the service they're providing is basically in the line of business of the putative employer, then they're an employee. So for example, the Uber driver, they do rides, right? They give rides to people. Uber's in the business of providing rides to people. Bingo, they're an employee. We don't even look at any of these other factors. They might do this for, for other ride share companies, doesn't matter. They might have their own car, doesn't matter. They might have other jobs, none of that matters. You know, that's the test, that's AB5. That's what's causing all the problems. Um, it's a radical, radical change. Uh, now it only applies for purposes of our labor and unemployment code. So that means that they have to get overtime, they have to get um, meal breaks, but it also means they can bring class actions if the employer gets it wrong. So that's why you're gonna see a ballot, on a, a referendum on the ballot this fall, I promise you, uh, trying to get that law reversed because it's, uh, it's pretty significant. It's put a lot of companies out of business. Um, I don't know if you're in that business, but I can tell you it is significant and it surprises people from outside. Why I'm mentioning it is that it's another diligence item that a venture capitalist is going to have to think about. Because before, this was an annoying issue, but the rules were such that a lot more people could be independent contractors. Now, um, almost nobody can be, unless you're in one of the statutory exceptions. So when AB5, so let me tell you a little bit about AB5. A, uh, a couple years ago, there was a Supreme Court case called Dynamics. And that Supreme Court case actually, actually created this new rule that treats basically um, gig economy employees as employees, gig economy workers as employees. It created that standard, that factor that I just told you about. Uh, as soon as that court case came down, pretty much every trade group in the world sent the, you know, teams of lobbyists to Sacramento to lobby to get a statute passed to change the rule. So it was a good news, bad news thing. The good news is that Sacramento paid attention, they talked to the lobbyists, they took legislative action. The bad news is, is they, they took the wrong kind of action. Instead of repealing the rule, they codified it. All right, so now, and the governor signed it. You know, another surprise. So, um, so now we've, we've got this, we have to live with it. Why am I spending so much time on this? Because it is a big, a big, big issue and it's a big diligence issue. And if you're a startup company and I know you're kind of cutting corners and maybe you're paying people with stock or maybe you're deferring or pay, or maybe you're not paying them at all, maybe you're calling them interns, be careful. This is gonna come up in diligence when you do a financing, because it could take the company down. If you don't believe me, there's a company you should Google called Homejoy. They raised $30 million of venture capital. They were an online platform, if you, and they, they had home uh, uh, housekeepers. So if, if you're a consumer and you're sitting at home and you say, gee, I could use a housekeeper, you go online, you find Home, Homejoy's platform, and you say, send me a housekeeper to clean up my house. They find one of their gig economy workers. They send him or her over. They clean it up. I pay Homejoy. Homejoy pays the housekeeper, and everybody used to be happy. <laughs> Not anymore. 
Those people uh, no longer have a job. They all have to move back in with their parents um, because California has deemed that they're not, they're not being protected enough. Uh, but that's not the bad news. The bad news is Homejoy got sued by one of those people. Class action lawsuit. Remember what I said? Class action. Employees can sue on behalf of everybody else, similarly situated, and that ended the company. And the CEO told Recode that the reason they couldn't raise any more money was because of that lawsuit. So this is a big issue. You know, they invest in, VCs won't invest in, in that sort of lawsuit. Um, deferred comp. I want you to be careful about this. I'm telling you about diligence issues that are going to stop you in your tracks before you can close your venture funding. A lot of companies, you can't pay people, right? So you defer the compensation. So I'll tell you what, it's, it's sort of the, the wimpy approach. Remember Popeye? Is anyone here old enough to remember the Popeye cartoon? That's right. I will gladly, if you give me a hamburger today, I will gladly repay you on Tuesday. Okay, that's deferred comp. You know, work today and I'll gladly pay you next year after we get funded. Um, that creates all sorts of tax problems. Um, I'm not saying you can't do it if it's properly structured. I'm saying it has to be you know, very carefully tailored because otherwise you create a tax penalty that could be half the amount of the deferred comp. Invention assignments. I want to mention this because um, it's uh, something that is easily overlooked. Uh, but, so when you form your, if you're a tech company, you need to be able to tell your venture capitalists that you own your intellectual property. And the term ownership, that's a legal term, it's a term of art, and what it means is that you can keep other people from using it, right? So if I own that chair, the, my rights of ownership include the fact that I can keep anybody from sitting on it if I want. Same with intellectual property. I can keep other people from taking my idea and doing something with it. Well, suppose you hire somebody to come do some coding for you or to do something technical or to help you with it. They might have a, a uh, non-exclusive right to that IP that they created, unless you've got a very clear document that says that whatever they created belongs to you, the company. So you need that, because without that document, you can't tell the VC that you can keep that person from using your IP. If you can't tell them that, you can't claim ownership. So invention assignments are very important. So you know, make sure that everybody who touches your trade secrets, your IP, will assign their rights to that IP to the company. And then finally, um, I want to mention the currency that we use to compensate people. So first of all, before we get into this, um, you know, this is for, for both California and federal purposes, we have a minimum wage law, minimum wage law. So if somebody is an employee, they have to be paid in cash, they have to be paid currently, right? You cannot pay them just in stock. You would violate our minimum wage laws, all right? You can't pay, you can't promise to pay them later. You'd violate our minimum wage laws. Now there are exceptions. There are exempt employees, for example. But the biggest exception is what we call the founder's exception. So this is our partner's exception. So for federal minimum wage, you know, founders typically, um, they're like partners, and partners don't have to receive minimum wage. We don't have that exception for California purposes. So again, once again, welcome to California, right? So you could be violating minimum wage laws without knowing it. Now this is one that the VCs will accept. You know, they'll understand that. And the reason why is because uh, not many founders are going to sue their own company for a minimum wage, right? It just doesn't happen very often. I'm not saying it never happens. If the founders have a falling out, it will happen, uh, possibly. But usually, we'll just live with that risk. But everybody else, everybody other than founders, um, you know, they have to be paid currently. Now, you can pay them cash and stock, or cash and options. The, uh, the trick here is that when somebody gets paid in property, that's a taxable transaction. Stock is property. So if you start handing out stock to people for doing <coughs> services, you're creating a taxable event for them. It's usually a really bad result. That's why we have options. Does everyone know what an option is? Right? It's a right to buy stock at a certain price, right? the strike price. So the grant of an option is not taxable. When they exercise the option, it probably is, usually is, unless it's an ISO, but the grant of the option itself is not. So that's why we use options in this valley. Um, about um, 15 years ago now, um, the tax law changed to make options really expensive to grant because you have to get a professional valuation. And uh, valuations used to be really expensive. So people stopped using options about that time, or they slowed down. There were less option plans in place. And, people, and companies would defer putting option plans in place until after they got funded. So they'd be hiring people, and they'd say, look, we're going to pay you minimum wage, 
and we're going to give you options in our company when we get an option plan. Can't give you an option today, don't have a plan, cost too much, got to get a very expensive valuation. But what we'll do is we'll give you an option a year from now after the VCs give us a bunch of money and we can pay for that valuation. That's the usual way of doing it now. Um, now, what I want to say about this is that the price of the valuations has just gotten dirt cheap, just dirt cheap over the last couple of years. And because of that, I'm seeing more and more people use startup companies, pre-funded companies, putting in place traditional stock option plans so they can grant options as currency. Because the problem with saying, you know, I'm going to give you an option later when we get an option plan. I mean, if I'm the employee, I'm thinking, well, wait a minute, the price is going to be high later. I want the price, I want today's option price, which is almost nothing. I don't want your option price after you get venture capital funding, which is going to be, you know, much higher. You know, plus I want my option too. I don't know if you're ever going to put an option plan in place. So just a little trend there. Uh, option plans are coming back in vogue. All right. Um, I want to say a few words about patents, unless Steve, you want to make a cameo appearance here. Steve Covey is the patent lawyer in our office, and he knows more about patents. Than, than, oh, jeez, clap, clap. you okay, got to get in so front of the camera. Yeah, I see. I see. I'm, gonna, I'm com coming from the back of the camera. <laughs> so I'm Stephen Colby, and I direct the IP Strategy Group. I am uh, a long-term patent attorney. Uh, mostly I prosecute patents, which means I work with startup companies and figure out what they need. And Apparently, I'm not loud enough. Okay, so I work with early stage startups. Um, I help them with their IP strategy. I help them to get patents. I help them figure out why they want patents. I also work with a lot of the angel funding groups. Uh, I find that when I get funding from my clients, they pay me, which is really good. Uh, I also, oh my gosh. Um, I also work on a lot of the things. Uh, our team at Royce Law is very interactive. So I work with the corporate groups and the employment attorneys and so on. Uh, we have a, an entire team that, that has everything a startup uh, company could want. Um, my background is I was a CTO for many years. I've been a CEO. Uh, so I am very deep into the startup culture, and I love it very, very much. Uh, on the IP side, um, I do a lot of the, th the early due diligence. When you, two people come to me with just an idea, I am ready to... Uh, ask all the questions that Roger's talking about right now and, and, and those questions about where you're getting your money and who's working with you and who your current employer is, all the things that could cause hiccups. I'm one of those people who asks those, those hard, tough questions when you're just getting started. Um, and that's kind of the attitude of the whole law firm. So if you have any specific patent uh, questions or IP questions, I'm going to be here uh, after Roger finishes. So Steve, could you uh, oh, comment talk? on what, what, a, what a patent is and why people want it? Uh, why do people want it? That's a tricky. So a patent allows you to exclude other people from doing something. If you have an invention, you can come to a patent attorney and spend a bunch of money on it and get a patent, and then that gives you the right to go to court and tell somebody else to stop doing it. That's kind of basically what a patent is. But for startups, patents are a lot different. Um, the reason is, is that enforcing a patent is maybe two to four million dollars, the cost, the legal cost of doing that. So if a startup is going to enforce a patent, they're probably no longer a startup, they're in a patent enforcement company. Uh, the value for patents and other types of IPs for startups is increasing your valuation, making you more valuable every time you get funding so that you convince that you are investors, that you know what you're doing and there's actually real value in, the, them, in you. And then on exit, your goal is to uh, probably either sell your company to some much larger company like Google or Facebook and walk out of there with a big fat pocketbook. Well, the patent portfolio you have when you sell is going to make a big difference in what you get for your company. I have seen literally cases where two almost identical companies are being sought after. The one with a better patent portfolio sells for almost $400 million, and two weeks later the other one closes down. And, and, and it was the IP that, that made the difference in that case. So getting a good patent portfolio is something you do to make your company more valuable and more appealable. That's it. Which is better, trade secret or patent? It depends on what it is. I, I have a, a like a two-page, two or three-page, well, well, like four-page now memo on trade secrets versus patents, and it depends on 
what the secret is, what uh, you do to keep it, uh, whether it's protectable, whether it's patentable. The thing about trade secrets, though, is you actually have to do something about them. There's been plenty of legal fights in the past where some employee leaves and goes to another company and, and spills all the beans. And, and then says, well, I didn't know this was a trade secret. So companies, just like patents, if you're going to have some trade secrets and you're going to try to make those the things that make your company more valuable, you need to document them. You need to have a trade secret program where people who have access, they sign off on it. They need to have, when an employee leaves, you have to remind them, here's the four trade secrets you saw. And here's the documents that you signed, remember? So that three years later, when they're their next you know, two jobs down the road, uh, they go, oh, yeah, I can't say anything about that. Otherwise, trade secrets tend to, uh, how do we say it in Silicon Valley, they go into the cloud. You know, and you never know where they're going to end up. So there are things that I can invite, and they're much, more, much cheaper than patents. But you actually have to do some work. You have to spend maybe 10 hours work, and you can get a great, great trade secret program in place. But you can't just say, oh, this is a trade secret without doing anything else. Right? All right. Thank you. Thanks very much, Steve. So we're gonna yeah we're gonna talk about that. So let me just add to that um, about the patents um, because <clears throat> just two things I want you to take away from this. Number one, the, the mistakes companies make with this is they wait too long before they actually file the patent. You know we're on a first to file system here in the United States now. So it's important to file early. And I know it's very expensive to get a patent. Guys like Steve, you know, are pretty pricey. But uh, no, he says he's not. Okay, but. <laughs> so I work with startups, which means companies that have very little money. So I can, a, a patent application, getting a full patent application to file is about fifteen to $17,000, which you probably in your first year of operation would rather spend somewhere else. We can work with you and get provisional applications on file and just get stakes in the ground uh, so that you have initial protection before you go out and s come to me before you talk to investors, right? Um, because we can get some initial protection for you, probably on the order of about $2,000, uh, where you're doing a lot more of the work. But, but I'll handhold you and get, that, get some provisionals filed, and, and that's really the way to bootstrap. And then you have a year within which to raise the money and file a, non, a full patent application. And if you haven't raised the money in a year, my suggestion is usually try something different at that point. <laughs> right, thank you. Question, yeah. Uh, so design patents, you mentioned that uh, uh, for startups, you know, it's more about evaluation. What about the design patent? Area? The design patent is um, usually much more limited in its value. It might be on the design of a hubcap or a tire or a, a speakerphone, a polycom speakerphone, is actually an example of a really valuable, that was a very valuable design patent. But they're rare, they don't really give you much, they're a good way to differentiate in marketing, but if something has utility, if it's useful, then it's got to be utility patent. Yeah. Right? Okay, so um, uh, just anecdotally, I think your takeaway from this should be, because sometimes you hear people say, gee, we're going to rely on trade secret, not patent. Like Steve says, that can make the difference between being a funded company or, you know, or being in the graveyard. So patents are important. They will increase your valuation. Uh, you should take care for that. Secondly, trademarks. <clears throat> trademarks are important. That establishes your brand. That identifies your company. And it is so wrapped up in the goodwill of your company that you want to make sure that you have the right to use your name and mark. And <clears throat> so what you should do early on in your business's life when you finally get a name or a mark that you like and you're going to use, first do a Google search. Be surprised how many people don't do this. Um, and then secondly, um, you should do what they call a patent and trademark knockout search and see if anybody has taken your mark. Because what you don't want to do is put a lot of time and money and effort into building all this goodwill around this name only to find out in due diligence you don't have the right to use it. Or to have a cease and desist letter that says you, know, you can't use that name. For some companies, as you can imagine, a name is so tied up with what they do. I mean, imagine your Snapchat or something where you're just relying on users knowing your name to come back to your site. If you can't use that name, you've lost your value. 
And if you don't figure that out, the VCs will. And then finally, trade secret, what Steve was just talking about. This is, I, I don't have a client that does not have trade secret information. This is typically the most valuable intellectual property asset you have, but it's also the easiest one to lose. Uh, and, here's, and here's why. So it's got to be three things to be a trade. And by the way, a trade secret, it's something that, that's valuable. It's proprietary. It might be a process. It might be your software code. It's not patentable. Um, uh, it's, it's valuable information proprietary information. And it's got to be three things. It's got to be valuable, okay? It has to be secret. And as Steve was talking about, you have to take reasonable efforts to protect it, to, to maintain its confidentiality, to maintain its secrecy. What do you think is a reasonable effort? What would be a good example of that? That everybody should, you know, have as part of your standard arson. And an NDA is right. An NDA. Everybody who sees your stuff, if it's secret, they got to sign an NDA, otherwise you're going to lose trade secret protection if you're, if you're not careful about protecting it. That's the, first, that's the first thing you should do. There are a lot of other things. Um, you know, uh, you should, you know, if you've got the time and you're interested in this topic, uh, you know, t take a look, Google the, the um, interestingly enough, the, the Google Waymo uh, court cases, and you will see the lengths that Google went to to, pr to protect and establish it's trade secret information. You know, very extensive documentation and writings and evidence that, look, this was developed right here, you know, at this date, at this time, so they could prove that it belonged to them, that it was trade secret. Uh, you as a startup should be doing that. You should be having a notebook, you should be documenting, everybody should be documenting what they're developing and where, and um, marking it confidential. So we don't have any question about this. Like I say, very easy to lose trade secret protection. Um, I think we talked about this enough. You know, I, I do want to move on from the, from the legal part about this to, um, to the intellectual property part that has to deal with how you're going to approach the market. And, you know, a lot of times um, companies, when you're getting started, especially if you're a tech company, you know that the temptation is almost irresistible to just develop the technology and then license it to somebody else. And there's nothing wrong with that. You know, that is a perfectly legitimate you know, per perfectly respectable business, but I will tell you that attracts a different kind of investor than a venture capitalist. That typically attracts somebody who looks for a little less return and a little less risk. And this is why, uh, this diagram right here. Generally, if you're a licensing play, um, you would expect to put less money into your actual product because you're not investing in manufacturing facilities, you're not investing in a lot of the things that the actual manufacturer is. So you're going to have less upfront costs. But again, you're going to have uh, less return on the back end. So that's exactly the opposite of what a VC is all about, right? The VC is about risking lots of capital upfront for that really huge return on the back end. So venture capitalists typically don't like licensing plays because there's just not, they're giving away too much of the upside. It's a lot like buying into a company that has a lot of debt that has to be paid before they can be paid, if you think of the license in, in that way. So just something to think about when you're thinking about approaching the market and how you're going to organize your company. Um, I think we've talked about IP ownership. You know, I do want to talk about, uh, we have about five minutes. So I want to mention something about joint ventures and licenses. And this has to do with how you're going to enter the market as a startup. I mean, part of the big thing that we do, especially in this valley uh, with our clients, is to protect them from giving away the farm. Um, so to speak, because a lot of companies will come up with a really good technology and remember what we said, they don't want to be this guy, they don't want to be a licensing company, they want to go for the gold, right? They want to be a, 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 vent, you know, a company that, that could be venture financeable, but they need to get some revenue, they need to get into the market, so they'll, they'll enter into joint ventures and licenses with really big companies. You have to be super careful about that, they don't ever sign anybody else's agreement without carefully reading it because the larger companies oftentimes will have an assignment of IP uh, right in their agreements. So in other words, yes, we're going to take your product, we're going to integrate it into ours, and we're going to sell it so you get market validation. And by the way, we own everything. You know, that's what the big company agreement will oftentimes say. I see that over and over again. And it can be very sophisticated and very complex, but the, but the, the fundamental um, 
point that I want you to keep in mind is you really need to keep control of that core technology. Now that doesn't mean you can't do joint ventures and licenses. That might be a really good way of proving that your product works. Um, for example, if your particular technology has applications in a lot of different industries, a lot of different fields, you might give somebody an exclusive right in a particular geography uh, to, um, to execute on your technology. So, for example, um, we're being recorded, so I have to be careful about who I talk about. But, for example, if, if you have um, a, technology, a con uh, technology that enables consumer goods, and you want to know that the consumers will actually want that product, you might give somebody in a joint venture arrangement an exclusive right to market that in a particular city. I've done that before. Why? Because even though they've got that city forever and ever, we are able to show the world that, that there's a market for this, that the tech works and that people will buy it. So this is a very strategic thing and you should really get together with your lawyer when you think about how you're going to approach the market, not only whether you're going to license or manufacture, but basically the agreements you're going to enter into, how that's going to affect your whole business and your whole business strategy, because that goes right to the core of what the VCs are investing in. IP ownership we talked about. I want to mention a couple, we only got two minutes left, so um, I finally get up to capitalization. Um, this is a typical cap table, and uh, you know when you sit down and start thinking about uh, selling equity to investors, this is an exercise you will go through, and you will strategize, or you should, and you will do what ifs. You say, what if we sell this much stock? What if that guy votes against me? You know, it's that kind of thing, and you should set this up on a cap table, and you can basically play this out under a lot of different scenarios and a lot of future financing rounds. It gives you a really good idea of where you are and where you're going to be after various financings. This one here goes all the way, uh, only goes past Series A, but we could do this um, through Series B. Now you'll notice I have two numbers in the columns. Um, we have the percent outstanding and the percent fully diluted. Those are two different numbers. Fully diluted, you're going to hear that a lot. Fully diluted means that we assume that all options that are granted are exercised. Sometimes it's, you know, vested options are exercised. Um, and it means all convertibles convert and all warrants exercise, etc. All of those instruments that could be stock turn into stock. That's a fully diluted number. The real number is really the percent outstanding where we don't count options because they have not exercised yet. They're not stock and they can't vote. Um, so those are two numbers you'll want to pay attention to. All right, we've, the last thing I'll mention because we're down to the end here um, has to do with funding. Um, so these days, uh, so when you go to do a venture round, you're going to do what they call a priced round. The VC is going to want to buy preferred stock in your company. That's a whole other hour discussion, okay, as to what those terms are. Before you get to that priced round, you're going to need money, right? You're going to need friends and family money. Um, you might need some angel money. The way we always do that these days, uh, almost always, is through what they call a safe. Uh, it used to be convertible notes, but now it's a safe. A SAFE is a simple agreement for future equity. It goes by other acronyms, but that's the general idea. The investor gives the company money. The company promises to give the investor stock when it sells stock to the VCs. It will give them that same preferred stock at a discount and subject to a valuation cap. Now, you should know three things about this. Number one, please do not download a SAFE agreement from the Internet and try to do this yourself. You're going to be surprised if you do. Because the ones on the internet, sometimes they're, they're drafted founder favorable, sometimes they're drafted investor favorable. Most of them are investor favorable now. And you might be giving away more stock than you think you are with these simple agreements for future equity. Um, to say nothing to the securities laws requirements that you need to, need to be concerned about. But a pre-money safe, for example, if my safe converts, if I buy a, a million dollar safe for a company, and it converts into stock on a $4 million pre-money valuation, that means I have 20% of the company you know, when the safe converts to stock, right? If it converts on a $4 million post-money valuation, it means I have 25%, right? So there's little things in these documents that can make a big difference uh, to how much of your company you're giving away. Valuation cap. These days, investors will always want a valuation cap. They want to know their safe money is not going to create a company with such a big valuation that they end up with a very small percentage of the company when they got in first, when it was really super risky. 
So we'll say, look, your safe is going to convert at the preferred stock price, but at no higher valuation than X. X is usually about eight to $12 million these days for an early stage company. And that means they know they're gonna get at least a certain minimum percentage of that company uh, when they do the um, safe conversion. And finally, the discount. That means the safe is gonna convert into preferred stock at a little better price than what the later preferred stock investors get. That's your reward for getting in early. So if the investor's paying a dollar a share, you're paying 80 cents a share, you the investor, something like that. Okay, well with that, Rob, I think we're gonna turn this over to you. Sorry I didn't get through all of my other stuff, but maybe we'll do another presentation. Okay, uh, let's, let's hear it for Roger. <laughs> By the way, if anybody wants the slides, I got through about half of them. Um, just leave me a card, I'm happy to share those with you. Or, or email Roger directly to work. We've got a full half hour of questions. We wanna take as many questions as possible. Once again, it's not legal advice, but it's free. Go for it. Uh, 8.30 p.m. We'll end the program. We have a raffle. We have some great items, including a book by Roger Royce, like Dead on Arrival. Uh, so we've got to be present to win, and then we'll break out the chocolate mousse, cake, and hot and nuts ice cream. So who's got a question for Roger? Ned, wait a minute. Ned has a question. So this microphone does not amplify. It records. So if that I'll works, repeat it. Tell me if it doesn't work. It works. Um, Thanks, Roger, as usual, for a very um, enlightening presentation. Um, one of the challenges that I have as a founder is that my company offers um, equity and, and utility tokens. Oh, God. Um, so, okay. So one of the challenges we have is that um, it's, it's difficult to factor into the valuation of the company the fact that there are tokens which, which could actually exceed the value of the intended equity rate. And um, investors have not, uh, traditional, I should say, conventional, traditional equity investors have not yet got the ground. And, and there is a communication barrier. Um, what are your thoughts about um, how this could be best communicated? Um, I actually um, created a formula where um, the equity can be uh, dynamically evaluated based on how the token rate goes. So the higher the token rate, the lower the equity. Your question is, how do you communicate that to investors? Um, yeah. Well, essentially, what, what are your thoughts on, on how you uh, do the equity valuation uh, with the uh, presence of a, of a, of a token raise? Of a, of a token raise. Uh, how do, yeah, so let, 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 let's level set here. So what Ned is talking about are, are tokens based on, based on blockchain technology, I assume. Digital assets. Everyone know what a token is? It's a, it's, it's a form of cryptocurrency, we'll say although it's not a currency, in this case it's a security. So it's a digital asset that, that is tied to some real world service value or asset. Um, that's the utility that you usually see in these tokens. So in other words, um, when somebody buys your stock, maybe you give them a, a token, which is this digital asset, a right to some service, that's a utility, or maybe it's a right to some asset, you know, that the company owns, that'd be a security token. Um, so, and, and when we go and launch these into the market, that's often done through what they call an ICO, an initial coin offering, uh, because it looks like an IPO. You're just distributing them out into the open market and people are buying it. Why do people do this? Why do we use these digital assets? Um, uh, first question, it's because of liquidity, right? Um, so here a company, can, it's called non-dilutive financing, right? Here a company can just, it's, like, it's almost like pre-selling its product or its service. So the company sells these tokens instead of its stock, so it doesn't dilute any of the stockholders. Uh, they get the money, the investor, they've got this digital asset that hopefully will increase in value, but, and, but they can usually often, or I should say often, their goal is to put it on an exchange so they can sell it very easily. S private company stock, it's very difficult to sell, right? I mean, it, 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 not just for legal reasons, because it's hard to find a market. But the idea behind tokens is you put them on an exchange and you can find a ready market for it. So that's why tokens are attractive. Uh, so the legal issue, of course, is that they are securities and they're subject to all the securities laws. And the Securities and Exchange Commission um, has really cracked down on this and they are continuing to do so. You know, I looked at their website this morning about this because I'm writing a chapter for a book on blockchain. And they say on their website that they've gotten more friendly, you know, and et cetera. 
you know, more, more cooperative. They've got more rules around this. They've given us more guidance. But it's really not true. You know, the United States securities regulators are hostile to tokens. That's why you're one of the few that's doing it here. Most of my clients have gone to a different country to do their token offering. So the venture community, to get back to your question, um, <laughs> so they hated these things when they first came out. And one of the reasons why is because suppose a guy like Ned, he has a bunch of tokens along with his stock. Well, Ned's the founder, you know, the VCs, they want Ned to stay in this company as long as possible. They want those golden handcuffs. The last thing they want is for Ned to have early liquidity, right, which you get with the tokens. So I've heard VCs say that. We don't want to invest in a company that's going to do tokens. In fact, we're going to put that right into the documents. And I've had to negotiate that language. It says this company will not issue any tokens. Uh, we will not do an ICO. Uh, the more friendlier VCs would say, you can do a token offering, but you've got to give us an allocation if you do issue tokens. Um, so I, I think the answer to your question is you've got to find smarter investors because the token economics is so complex. Uh, you know, even not even doing what you're doing, just understanding how the value is going to increase, you know, how those network effects can increase the value of the stock and of the company. I would find investors who understand that. And they're out there. Blockchain capital, they love public blockchain companies. You know, they understand it very well. There are investors that will do this. So, you know, not just for you, but everybody. Pick your investors carefully. That's a long-winded answer to a short question, but oh, oh well. Welcome. Anybody else? Oh, geez, I get to go home early. Oh, okay. Uh, maybe not so much Airbnb, but if you're a, a platform company, um, if, you're, um, if you're the kind of company that you use subcontractors, it affects you, right? If you use contractors, it probably affects you. Uh, I had, uh, I've had so many companies call me now uh, and say a couple of things. Number one, um, th three things. First one, the day the governor signed it, I had a company call me and say, we're out of business, you know, because we're a platform, we're just like HomeJoy, remember HomeJoy, and this makes all my all these people employees, I gotta get workers comp, we can't afford it, we're out of business. I don't think it affects, it affects you if you hire people who, if you hire workers is when it affects you. So I don't think it affects Airbnb. Airbnb isn't hiring anybody, right? They have a platform for people to rent, not to exchange services. It affects you if your platform is dealing in services. Yeah. Um, but, but on that point, I've also had companies say, you know, I've had people come to me and say, you know, I used to have, I used to do this contracting work for this out-of-state company, but now that they know that I'm an employee, they're not going to hire me. They, they fired me. They're going to go hire a guy in Nevada or Arizona. Or, or, or any of the other, there's 48 other states that don't have this silly rule. There's only one other that does. Um, yes, sir. Yes, uh, thank you very much for this uh, information, Mr. Royce. Uh, just a couple of quick, quick questions. So first, uh, you told us how much uh, the advisor gets. You didn't mention how much uh, the board of directors, what <laughs> do they expect to get? Oh, okay, sorry. So the question is how much stock, uh, what should you give a, a board member yeah. for being on your board? Um, uh, well, that's, I think that's a little less, that's, it's a lot less uh, market standard than it is for advisors because it depends. Depends on the stage of the company, depends on the size of the board, um, depends on how active your board is. Um, I sit on several boards and uh, my experience is, is that as odd as this sounds, is that the board member you know, gets a little less than what's standard for an advisor. And, and the reason I say that, uh, when they start bringing in outside board members, and I think the reason why is by the time a company does that, because usually, it, here's why, because it's going to be founders are going to be on the board, um, and then the VCs are going to be on the board, and then they'll get some industry luminary who will get a big grant because he's a big deal. But by the time they start bringing in like outside directors down, down the road, the company's built up a lot of value, so the stock is worth a lot more. So I'm seeing, you know, less, definitely less than 1% uh, later on, probably more than that early on. But again, very, very, uh, I think that's a much more fact-intensive issue. You know, board members, keep in mind, a board of advisors is way different than a board of directors. Um, a board of advisors has no fiduciary duties, um, and they don't make any decisions, right? They're just there to advise. 
uh, directors uh, way less particular expertise, but they're fiduciaries. You know, they can actually make decisions that bind the company. So a lot of people get those kind of confused or they equate them, board of advisors, board of directors, but they're much different. Things. In fact, the board of advisors would probably never even meet each other, you know, whereas the board of directors will sit down and make decisions jointly. Uh, thank you for that. Just another one. If I okay. Uh, you spoke, you said that uh, it's better to give the stock options and not just the stocks yeah. themselves. Yeah. So my question is, let's say that I'm giving this and this amount of stocks. How do I know how much equity did I, did I really gave so far? Like, is there like a calculation somehow that I know how many percentage all of those options really work? So the question is, um, if you grant options, because people are ac exercising, how do you know how much equity is actually being given out? Yeah, they call that option overhang. <laughs> and um, so the, there is an answer to that. And typically, a stock option plan will be about 20% of your fully diluted capitalization of the company. Um, sometimes a little less, sometimes a little more, but typically around 20%. Uh, of that 20%, they're going to be granted to a bunch of people, a big group of people. Enough that we can statistically sort of estimate, you know, how many people are going to exercise at any given time and how many people are going to leave without having ever exercised. It's close enough that, um, that, um, that we'll just assume that all of the options issued, um, issued and are vested uh, will have been exercised for purposes of calculating our fully diluted capitalization and we won't increase the value of the company by their exercise price because it's very low. So we just make that assumption. That's fully diluted. But you're right. The bigger that option pool, the more that overhang is, the more that um, uncertainty is. Mm -hmm. So I've seen companies where they say, oh, we're going to, you know, we don't want to want anyone to pay any tax on stock. We're going to give away 50%. In fact, I had a client, and he's a founder of a public company, and he had like 30% of the stock of the company in options. It's crazy. You have no idea how much stock is outstanding when you've got one guy owns that many options because you don't know if that one guy is going to exercise or not. You know, you can assume a broad group of people, you know, enough, enough of them are going to exercise or stay with the company until it exits. But one guy, you don't. And the other thing, problem you have is when you start using options improperly like that is at some point you've got to say, wait a minute, the exercise price is kind of a big chunk of money. So if people exercise, the value of the company is going to go up. So they call that the treasury stock method of measuring, you know, what the options are worth because you assume that people... So you assume the fully diluted capitalization, but you assume that they paid the exercise price, which increases your price per share. So it gets very complicated if you don't, if you, yeah, be careful with options. You know, if you get beyond like kind of our, our, our cookie cutter, you know, rules, um, then, you, you know, you can start messing up your capitalization table. Does that make sense? Yes, I'm still a little bit complicated, a little bit uh, confused about that. But well, I didn't mean the, the main message that he, you're yeah. delivering. Let me, let me simplify. I didn't mean to confuse you with that because those are the outliers. Those are the cases that don't happen. In a typical case, you know, you, you're, you will, you'll have two columns in your cap table. One is, uh, where is it? One is, is uh, issued stock and the other is fully diluted. Oh, well. I had it there a minute ago. You remember. And the issued stock is people who have actually purchased the stock. They've exercised the option. That's the voting stock. The number that people look at is fully diluted, right? Because the VCs say, well, we're going to assume that every option that's been granted um, and is vested is going to be exercised. We just make that assumption for purposes of valuing this company and determining how much of the stock we get. That's how they look at it. So the answer to your question is, yeah, that you, you don't really know. You know, that's just our, the rough guess that we all live with. Okay, thank you. Uh, just one last question. I wanted to know. Okay, last equity, question. Yeah, the equity that the advisors get is it uh, diluted or non diluted or non diluted? It, it's no. The, the advisors, when you say so, the question is, do the advisors get diluted or non dilutable equity? Um, don't ever use non dilutable equity. You'll be sorry. I mean, I tell people to do that, and then they do it anyway, and then they're sorry. Um, because if, if something is, you know what he means by non diluted. It means that you're going to promise somebody a certain percentage. So when a company's worth a million dollars and they got 1% non-diluted, it means when a company takes in $9 million of investment, it's not worth $10 million, they still have 1%. So they made 10 times as much without doing anything. Don't, don't do that. 
And, and what, as a practical matter, what that non-dilutant means, and you see that sometimes we use uh, warrants uh, in order to maintain somebody's percentage interest. The later investors are not getting diluted by anything you've done before they come in. When the VCs come in, they're going to make a pancake out of everything you've done. They're going to say, look, we want this percent. You know, and if you get some deal with your co-founders that you're not going to be diluted, that's between you guys. You know, that means you, the founders, are going to get diluted every time you know, they do that. The VC is not going to pay for your mistakes. They're not going to take your dilution. So, so I really don't think you should do that. Uh, accelerators will ask for that a lot of times. Yeah, they'll want. Oh, I want. But the way they say it is, I, we want six percent or eight percent non-diluted through your first round. So you'll do that. Okay, you you know, it, it sucks, but okay, they're a big shot accelerator. We'll let them do that, and there's a cap on it. It ends after the first round. But once in a while, you see people say, oh, forever and ever, you have, you know, 1% of this company. Well, that's coming out of you, the founder's pocket, if you do that. I wonder if I can get this to expand again. Oh, okay. So my question is, um, What's the typical structure that you set up for Delaware Corp, let's say? So uh, to uh, make an example of my question, let's say I come to you and say, okay, I want to set up a Delaware Corp. We're all brand new. We've got two co-founders. We want to make sure we have the option to for employees in the future and so forth. Yeah. So what I see is that you do, what, 10 million authorized shares? Yeah. And out of the 10 million, what's next, what's next? So how, just the overall yeah. structure, just give an idea. But let's go back to my cap. That's the second cap table question. So I want to go back to it because I kind of went through that fast. The question is the structure. So I like to start with 10 million authorized. 20 million is just fine. Um, in this case here, we've got, it uh, doesn't say how many is authorized, but this looks like there's probably 5 million authorized. But somewhere in that range. I like 10. Nice round number. Of that, I like to issue eight million to the founders and leave two million reserved for an option pool. Option pool. Now, the tricky thing about Delaware corporations is that the bigger that gap between issued and reserved, you have to pay a Delaware tax. It's normally small, but the bigger that gap, the bigger the tax gets. And if the company get, and, and I mean, you have to work your way through the calculation. But at the end of the day, once the company gets some assets, if you've got a big gap between issued and authorized, you've got a big tax to pay. So, so 80% of the uh, authorized for the founders? Yeah. And then the other 20% would be for employees, advisors? Right, so right. 80 for the founders, 20 for your service providers is what I like to start with. And then you sort of go through that process until you get to see what you then you go to Series A and you'll amend your documents. You'll increase your authorized shares for the. Um, um, uh, no, um, pr probably not at that point. At that point, you're just increasing the shares to include the preferred stock. But, but you know what? Eventually, the number of shares is going to go up, and it's going to depend on your valuation. Because what you're trying to do, this is more psychology than anything else, but you want to keep your stock option price relatively low, right? Because your employees, they got options. Everybody in Silicon Valley has options. And if, if they think that their stock option price is too high, if it's higher than the guy at the company next door, even though economically, you know, we know that it depends on how many shares, and what percentage, you know, how many shares are authorized, we want to keep the price low. It's just psychologically, we keep the number of shares high, so we keep the option price low. And that also, you know, it's just the way we do it. We keep the option price low. I know that sounds silly, but it's it's important. And then what's a typical vesting plan you put in for that 80% of the initial? Uh, well, for founders, I'll vest usually three, sometimes mm -hmm. four. Three is founder favorable. Um, four is more typical. Uh, sometimes you see five. Um, and uh, for the optionees, it'll be four or five years. Okay. And to follow up with my last question, is typically based on the deals we see with the VCs and raising funds in Silicon Valley today, which a lot of people are saying the public and so forth, and so you're not you know, chasing too much money chasing the deals. What kind of deals are you seeing in terms of percentage? So, for example, the series A, are you seeing 15%, 10%, 20%? Not on the conservative side, but on the best cap case scenario. The best case for the company? Yes. Meaning that they give away the least amount of equity? Yes. Ten, 10%. I see 10% series A deals. That's the best case. 
Yeah. Uh, twenty to forty. Here's here's the thing. So the, the VC, you know, this it's the way fund economics in, are. They they can't make that many bets because they really do have to manage that investment. They have to sit on that board. So they need relatively big pieces of the company. You know, so um, your typical VC is, you know, and then they're, and then they're leading. They're probably bringing other VCs in. So um, uh, twenty to thirty is probably is probably more more accurate. So twenty percent for the leading or the group of the group, the whole group. The group. What yeah. about the funding before that? So convertible Yeah, they all roll into that funding. They all roll into that financing. It's just you know, rules of thumb are kind of risky because every company is different. But my rule of thumb is that you're going to give about the same amount of away, away to the B, which is going to put you over 50% to the investors after the B round. That's generally true, except in biotech. But that's generally true, I think. Thank you. Um, okay. So, um, this is uh, this is our. Uh, one, one of the guys puts in a lot of money out of the for about starting out the company. How do you suggest we could be to the investors? One person put in money, the other two didn't. Mm -hmm. Are you three equally, okay, three founders, one founder puts in cash, uh, the other two don't, but all three of you are equally involved in the operations of the business. Yeah. So one way to, to manage that is have the, the founder who put in the money take back a promissory note. So he loans the money to the company. He may have to contribute it later, but um, maybe he'll get it paid back. That's one way of equalizing it. And then, yeah, and then, and then, and then divide up the equity. So that's one way. That's assume, assuming that all three of you are, you know, kind of equal partners in this. Another way is, is to do something like a dynamic split or a formula where we say, look, I put in money, so I should get this much. You should take a look at the, the online calculator. I should, money is usually worth like four times what services are in terms of, of what you should get. Say, so look, I put in money, so I should get more than you two guys, you know, by, by a factor of two to four. That's a, that's a formula that's used. Can that be allotted to suppose a CTO or an advisor, or is it only for the founder? It, it could be, but it doesn't. I mean, I don't know why you would do that. So the question is, a super voting stock. I mean, founders keep that. The reason you have that is because the founder doesn't want to give up control. So if he's going to take that stock and give it to an advisor, it kind of defeats the purpose. He's just giving control to somebody. I've never seen anyone do that. Like I have a CTO who I don't pay, right? So I want to give him some stock. <laughs> <laughs> so you want to give him stock instead? Yeah, I want to give him some stock. Have you been paying attention? Did you hear anything I said tonight? <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, but I know that goes on. Yeah. Um, well, uh, there's no value. You don't get additional value. Mm -hmm. You're thinking of a different kind of stock, I think, like a preferred stock maybe. That's more valuable than the other common. This just has more voting rights. Okay. So, and again, it's all going to go away when the VCs get involved anyway. So it's sort of a, it's a, it's a fake victory. Okay. You have a CTO who's got stock, so you do have a technical co-founder. I mean, he doesn't compete himself a co-founder because he's actually a Oh, uh, I might. How much stock does he have? He just leaves it up to me from the time on. Wow, good CTO. <laughs> See, that's why, that's why you're the business person and he's the technical person. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm a late comer to a startup. Uh, it has already got a, a, a team of two who have been working for uh, almost a year and I'm just joining negotiating the equity. So for a late comer, before any investment, usually, uh, yeah, so the, so the question is, this happens a lot. We've got a company that's got two founders. They've decided they need a third founder. Two years later, they find you and they say, come on in. We're going to give you stock. 
you can be a founder along with us. Problem you've got, you've got a tax problem now. Because when those founders formed the company, the tax rules allowed them to get their stock tax free. Two years later, now you come along, and the tax, you know, the tax rules don't give you that same benefit. The reason why is it's tax free if the transferors immediately after the transfer have more than 80% of the stock at the company. You're now the transferor two years later. After the transfer, you're going to have less than 80%. So you don't fall within this exception. You're going to be taxed on the value of your stock. That, that's given to you in exchange for any property. You're going to be taxed on a value that given for services. So, so you, you got one or two, two choices. You can take an option, but then we got the problem of the option overhang. You got this big, humongous option now uh, that's unexercised, which messes up your cap table. Uh, so I wouldn't do that, but you don't get taxed on the option grant. Or you can buy the stock. And you're going to say, well, geez, i got to put cash into this company. Those other two guys didn't put cash in. Why do I have to? So we can ameliorate that. We can have you buy the stock with a promissory note. So in other words, you give me the stock, I'll write you this note. And then, of course, the problem is that note has to be paid someday or forgiven. And when it's forgiven, you get taxable income. Yeah, this happens all the time. We could go way down the rabbit hole on what your options are. But there's a way to, to skin this cat. Uh, it's, it's not going to be completely painless, though. That's right. You can probably buy it really low right now, but keep in mind the difference between the value and the price you pay is taxable income to you. Yes, yes. Right. Yeah. Okay, I think we got time for one more. So with this with this late founder, um, they probably have a vesting schedule too. Yeah. And do the does the tax event occur on vesting or when they're rent? So again, it's complicated. The general rule is the tax event occurs on vesting. And the amount of stock that vests is taxable income as of the time of vesting at the value at the time of vesting. So if the stock goes way up in value and it vests way out here, that's a really bad result. It's a lot of taxable income. Um, you can make what's called an 83B election and close the compensation element and treat it all as owned for, and vest it for tax purposes on a day that you get it. So then when it vests going forward, you don't have any additional income. And by the way, for a startup company, we do that every single time. You would never do anything other than that. For a public company, you would never do that. There's too much value. So that's, yeah. okay, all right, take one more. Um, <coughs> Yeah. So um, I work for a company. We provide infrastructure technology for companies. Yeah. And you know, like what AWS does. From scene to scene, do you see that there's a logical jump when a company says, "Hey, we're taking that next step and infrastructure grows." Like, I'm trying to figure out the folks on the C, which is great, or the Joe, or like when they get to the future, do they have cash infusion now they want to. Jumping at any one particular life cycle. Well, it, well if, if I understand your question, I, I think you're you're asking me at what stage do you do another financing? Is that it? Um, well, just where, where you see that the growth really occurs from a startup, where then you know that's I, I focus on B series right now. Yeah. But from here today, I see a lot of people that didn't end up being unicorns. So I'm just wondering in your in your opinion. Yeah, yeah, I, I don't know. I think that's very fact specific, but um, I've got data someplace on how many. Well, here, here's one that I do remember. So a typical, typical exit in this valley, a company will have raised $51 million by the time it exits. Um, so that means a lot of that growth, it seems to me, is coming later on in those later stages. But I think the big growth, percentage-wise, has got to be in an early stage because it's so risky that if they do make it to the later stage, you know, they must have had a huge... Yeah, it's in an early stage, clearly. By the way, typical company here will do four rounds of financing and take seven years to exit. But yeah, I think the, the big, humongous growth is going to be in that early stage because there's so many more failures, you know, at the early stage. So many... Because there's a lot less money for the B and C rounds, right? So you know they're not going to make it. You know, only a certain percentage are. So it just seems the reason that 
that you'd have. You know. So for say this using a C A Yeah, yeah. So first prize, uh, Roger. So by Roger Royce, dead on arrival, how to avoid the legal mistakes that could kill your startup. You can get signed by the author himself. Uh, Keshav Narain, MD. Hey, what do you know? Come on down. Come on in. <laughs> Claim your prize. Do you want to follow up Roger? Thank you. Do you want to follow up Roger? Sure. Yeah. Oh, you hesitated there for a second. We've got to find someone with a camera here. Nice camera. Yeah, hold the book up. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Next Thank one. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Oh, Colby, drum roll. Next prize. One of those. Uh, Oren. Yep. With the smiley face. <laughs> All right. He's got a reason to smile now. <laughs> Thank you, sir. All pleasure. right. Congratulations. All right. Thank you. Oh, Thank you. Thank you. Actually, my personal library. Leadership and the One Minute Manager. Well, I didn't write that. Someone yeah, I know. It's, someone else has got it. Okay, who wants to pick a card? <laughs> it's regifting, but it's still good. So uh, you, can, you can draw the card. Anyway. And the winner is. Oh, we've got a couple winners here. Scott Williams. Scott. Well, must be, be present, present to win. win. Going once, going twice. Scott went home. What? All right. We'll take another one. Snooze, you lose. Jen. Hey, Jen, Jen, come on down. All right. Congratulations. You got to get a picture of Rob. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Long photo. Uh, yeah. All right, I'll, come all. Uh, this is the grand prize by yeah, City National right. Bank. Uh, it's an awesome picture frame. Right? Well, picture yeah. diploma in there or something. All right, the winner is small. Neil Dink. Neil? Neil Dink. Come on down. All right. So, uh, oh, put that. Okay. Right there. Now we will sing happy birthday to idea to idea. Today is the 10th anniversary. Sure, sure. Oh, okay, right. thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Right. Good meeting you. Good luck. There you go. Happy birthday to you. Come on, stand up. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, idea to IPO. Happy birthday.